In this video, we're going to be talking about how to find the horizontal and vertical tangent lines of a function and how to use the information that we find to say where a function is differentiable. So the first thing we have to keep in mind is that when we're talking about horizontal and vertical tangent lines, the first thing we're going to need to do is find the derivative of the original function that we've been given. So in this problem, we have the function f of x is equal to x times the square root of 1 minus x squared. We've been told that we're only interested in the portion of this function over the interval x greater than or equal to negative 1 and less than or equal to 1. So between negative 1 and positive 1, that's the interval that we're interested in for this function. And if we go ahead and graph that, the function looks like this over the interval negative 1 here on the left-hand side to positive 1 here on the right-hand side. So we'll revisit this graph a little bit later, but for now what we're looking for is horizontal and vertical tangent lines. So if we find the derivative of the original function, so if we find f prime of x, the derivative, remember that the derivative is the same thing as the slope of the tangent line. And remember that the slope of a horizontal line is always zero, and that the slope of a vertical line is undefined. So since the derivative is the slope of the tangent line, if we find the derivative and then we set the derivative equal to zero, that will give us the points of tangency for any horizontal tangent lines. If we find the derivative and then find the values of x where it's undefined, that will give us the points of tangency for any vertical tangent lines. So let's walk through that and see what that looks like, and then we'll talk about differentiability at the end of the problem. So first we're going to find the derivative of f of x, and what we need to realize is that we're going to need to use product rule to find the derivative because we have the product of two functions. So x here is one function and the square root of 1 minus x squared is the other function. So because we have two functions that are multiplied together, we need to use product rule to take the derivative. So product rule tells us we're going to take the derivative of the first function. So the derivative of x is 1, so we say 1, and then we're going to multiply that by the second function without doing anything to it. So 1 minus x squared square root. And then we're going to add to that the opposite situation. So this time, we're going to leave the first function alone. So we're just going to leave x alone. And we're going to multiply by the derivative of the square root of 1 minus x squared. Well, the derivative of the square root of 1 minus x squared, first of all, we have to think about that in a different way. So the square root of 1 minus x squared, that's the same thing as 1 minus x squared raised to the 1 half power. So if we want to take the derivative of this, we have to use power rule and chain rule together. So power rule tells us that we bring this exponent down in front here, so we're going to say 1 half times 1 minus x squared, and then here we subtract 1 from the exponent, so 1 half minus 1 is a negative 1 half. But we just took the derivative of the outside function, and chain rule tells us that we take the derivative of the outside function while we ignore the inside function, so that 1 minus x squared is the inside function. But then we have to multiply by the derivative of the inside function. So our inside function is 1 minus x squared, 1 minus x squared. The derivative of that, if we take it term by term, the derivative of 1 is 0. The derivative of negative x squared is a minus 2x. So it's really just negative 2x. So we have to multiply this result here by negative 2x. So this is going to be our derivative function. Now we just need to simplify it. So first, we want to go ahead and cancel the 2 from the denominator with this 2 from the numerator here. So when we simplify, we'll say f prime of x is equal to 1 times the square root of 1 minus x squared is still just the square root of 1 minus x squared. Here, we have x times a negative x, so we're going to say minus x squared times 1 minus x squared quantity raised to the negative 1 half power. Well, this negative 1 half, we can make that exponent positive by moving this 1 minus x squared to the denominator. So if we move that whole thing to the denominator, what we're going to end up with is minus x squared divided by 1 minus x squared raised to the positive 1 half power. So that exponent just becomes positive when we move this whole thing to the denominator and then this disappears because it gets moved to the denominator. But now here, 1 minus x squared to the 1 half is the same thing as the square root of 1 minus x squared. So if we rewrite it, we can say f prime of x is equal to the square root of 1 minus x squared minus 
x squared divided by square root of 1 minus x squared. Now what we want to do is combine these two terms, but in order to do that, we're going to have to find a common denominator. So this denominator over here is the square root of 1 minus x squared, which means that we want to multiply this first term here by 1 minus x squared, take the square root of that, divided by square root of 1 minus x squared squared. So we're multiplying this first term by 1 because when we have the same thing in the numerator and denominator, this fraction is equal to 1. So we're only multiplying this term by 1. We're not actually changing the value. But by doing this, we'll end up with this square root of 1 minus x squared in the denominator, and we'll have the same denominator as this second term here. So then we can say f prime of x is going to be equal to, we'll take this square root in the numerator and multiply it by this square root in the numerator. Because we have the same value underneath the square root signs, the square root signs cancel and we're just left with 1 minus x squared without the square root. But we still have this square root of 1 minus x squared in the denominator, which comes from right here. And then we have a minus x squared over square root of 1 minus x squared, this second term here. And now because we have the common denominator, the denominator is the same, we can combine the two fractions and say f prime of x is going to be equal to, in our numerator we'll have 1 minus x squared minus x squared. So that's going to be 1 minus 2x squared over the square root of 1 minus x squared. So now that we have our derivative simplified, remember that we said our derivative was the slope of the tangent line. The derivative is always the slope of the tangent line. So horizontal lines have a slope of 0. So if we say that the slope here is equal to 0, we're basically setting the derivative equal to 0. So we say 0 equals 1 minus 2x squared divided by square root of 1 minus x squared. So we just set the derivative equal to 0, and we want to solve for values of x that make this equation true, because those are the values of x where horizontal tangent lines will occur. But remember, when you have a fraction, the only way that this fraction is going to be equal to 0 is if the numerator is equal to 0. So really, the only way this equation is true is if 1 minus 2x squared the numerator is equal to 0. So now we can just solve this equation. We'll add 2x squared to both sides, and we'll get 1 is equal to 2x squared. We'll divide both sides by 1 half, and we'll get 1 half is equal to x squared. If we take the square root of both sides, we get x is equal to positive or negative square root of 1 half. But remember that when we take the square root of a fraction, we can take the square root of the numerator and the denominator separately. So we get x is equal to positive or negative square root of 1 divided by square root of 2. The square root of 1 is just 1, so we actually get x equals positive or negative 1 over the square root of 2. But then if we want to rationalize the denominator, we can multiply both the numerator and the denominator by the square root of 2, and so we get x is equal to positive or negative root 2 over 2, because 1 times square root of 2 gives us root 2 in the numerator. Square root of 2 times square root of 2 gives us 2 in the denominator. So what this is telling us then is that horizontal tangent lines occur for this function at the points x equals negative root 2 over 2 and positive root 2 over 2. These values of x are both within the given interval negative 1 to 1, so they both apply to this problem. If we had found a value that was outside of the given interval, we could go ahead and ignore it because the problem is only asking us for horizontal and vertical tangent lines on this interval. But both of these occur in the interval, so we'll go ahead and say that we have horizontal tangent lines at both of those points. Now when it comes to vertical tangent lines, remember that the slope of a vertical line is undefined. Since the derivative is the slope of the tangent line, we're interested in the points where this right-hand side here is undefined. So which values of x are going to make this right-hand side undefined? The only times when this right-hand side here, this fraction, is going to be undefined is when the denominator is equal to 0, because a fraction is always undefined when the denominator is 0. We can't have 0 in the denominator because we can't divide by 0. So what we want to say is square root of 1 minus x squared equal to 0, and we want to solve this for x. So we'll do that by squaring both sides. We'll square both sides in order to get rid of the square root. So this squaring gets rid of the square root, and we're left with 1 minus x squared. 0 squared is still 0. 
If we add x squared to both sides, we get 1 is equal to x squared. And then if we take the square root of both sides, we get x is equal to positive or negative square root of 1. The square root of 1 is 1, so we get x is equal to positive or negative 1. Both of these values are also in the interval. In fact, they're the endpoints of the interval. So we can say that the function has vertical tangent lines at x equals positive or negative 1. Now if we wanted to go ahead and graph these tangent lines, what we could do is take a look here at the graph and we could say that horizontal tangent lines occur at x equals negative root 2 over 2 and positive root 2 over 2. So if we find x equals negative root 2 over 2, what we find is that it's about this point right here. And so we could say that the graph has a horizontal tangent line at this point and we can see that that makes sense because this is the local minimum of the function. It's the point at which the function changes direction and so the slope of the tangent line there is going to be zero. It's going to be a perfectly horizontal tangent line because that's the very bottom of the graph in this region. We can also say the function has a horizontal tangent line at positive root 2 over 2 which as you might expect is about at this point right here and you can see that that would make sense if we just sketch a tangent line through that point of tangency it looks like it should be a horizontal tangent line. Vertical tangent lines on the other hand we have at x equals positive 1 and x equals negative 1. So if we graph those here x equals negative 1 we can see that they intersect the graph at this point of tangency right here, right at the end point of the interval that we've been given. So we have a vertical tangent line here, and right at this point here, we have the point of tangency and a vertical tangent line that runs through that point. And that makes sense because if we were going to draw a tangent line to the graph at that point, it looks like it would be a vertical tangent line. Now if we wanted to find the coordinate points of these points of tangency, all we would have to do is plug these x values back into the original function. Not the derivative, but the original function. Because this here, this graph, is the graph of the original function. And so if we wanted to give this point of tangency right here, we already know that the value of the x coordinate there is negative root 2 over 2. So we'd say negative root 2 over 2 we could plug this x value back into our original function. And if we did that, the value we would get back would be negative 1 half. I'll let you do it so we don't take extra time, but that would be the value we would get back for y. If we plugged in x equals positive root 2 over 2, that would be up here, so x is positive root 2 over 2, the value we would get back for y would be 1 half. And that makes sense because we can see that y is 1 half right here and that y is negative one half right here. Same thing here with our vertical tangent lines. If we plug in x equals positive and negative one to our original function, we can get the associated y values for the coordinate points. The coordinate point that we would find here would be negative one for x and zero for y. Here we would get positive one for x and zero for y. And that should make sense because we can see that both of these points of tangency are right along the x-axis where we know that the value of y is zero. We have this y equals zero value along the x-axis. So we have those points as the points of tangency for the horizontal and vertical tangent lines. And then when it comes to differentiability, remember that a function is always differentiable, which means we can take its derivative or we can find its derivative wherever the function is continuous and defined. So if we just look at the graph of this function or if we look at f of x, we can see that it's going to be continuous everywhere on this interval, x greater than or equal to negative 1 and less than or equal to positive 1. But a function is also not differentiable if it has a vertical tangent line at a point in its domain. So these endpoints here, x equals negative 1 and x equals positive 1, we've already shown that there are vertical tangent lines at those points. So what we can say is that this function is differentiable everywhere inside the interval except at x equals positive 1 and x equals negative 1 because that's where vertical tangent lines occur. And that's how you find the horizontal and vertical tangent lines of a function.